The Seek Human Rights Group proudly presents our Environmental and Diversity Speaker Series. Today's topic, addressing climate change through the lens of environmental physics. Today you'll be listening to Mr. Daniel Winter. Mr. Winter's background is as multifaceted as his viewpoint. Graduating with honours from the University of Detroit, Daniel pursued graduate studies in uh, psychophysiology and the origins of language. In addition to his academic background, he has worked as a system analyst with IBM, an industrial meteorologist and crystographer. He has undertaken many diverse studies from quantum physics to modeling at the MIT Space Lab to developing the early feedback prototype equipment as Dr. Albert Axe's protege. In the 1980s, he found an alternative newspaper entitled The Network of Light. He established a learning center experiment in collective bioharmony called Crystal Farm, uh, sorry, Crystal Hill Farm. At Crystal Hill Farm, Stan's extensive network grew as he hosted conferences with a prolific li- uh, list of presenters on varied topics, from sacred geometry to sustainable ecosystems. He maintained an elaborate computer music video facility where his computer animated videos on sacred geometry and new age physics evolved. While directing Crystal Hill Farm, Daniel was vice president and technical director of SS Electrical Incorporated in Buffalo, which markets his engineered three-phase conversion motor technology around the USA. Through the years, Dan has lectured on the evolution of consciousness, sacred geometry and coherent emotion at many national and international conferences. His theories in coherent emotion inspired the notable research at Millard Fillmore Hospital in Buffalo and the Heart Math Institute in California in the mid 90s. Results published by Dr. Glenn Rain provided conclusive evidence supporting Dad's, uh, Dan's heart entrainment theories. Dan draws on many sources, including science, mythology, popular culture, and even channeled information, looking for ideas about the deep connectiveness of all things and how the profound nature of our oneness can be approached from architecture or art, math or biology, electronics, computers, or myth. Recorded live on the 19th of January, 2022, this is the 13th podcast in Seek Human Rights Group's Environmental and Diversity Speaker Series. Welcome, Dan, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, th- I think that uh, bio is about 50 years old, but <laughs> it's, it's fun. Thank you. Uh, well, um, actually, that leads me quite um, nicely on to my next question. Um, and that is, Dan, could you begin by telling our audience um, a little bit about the invaluable uh, environmental protection work that you and your colleagues have done in the past uh, and are currently undertaking? Well, thank you. Yes, uh, that does bring us to the heart of the matter, which is the title of my book is Origin of Neg Entropy. Negentropy means origin of, origin of self-organizing systems. A key example regarding environment, when Lovelock famously wrote the book, uh, The Gaia and the Gaia Hypothesis, he presented extensive, a book full of evidence showing that something about Earth is self-organizing. For example, Gaia seems to have self-organized and self-regulated temperature, pressure, and moisture for you know, hundreds of thousands of years. And that apparent ability to become self-organizing or negentropic or never to go into chaos was a key mathematical feature of Gaia. Now, they didn't uh, promote any particular theory of how or why Earth, Gaia, Mother Earth became negentropic, self-organizing, self-regulating, but clearly presented solid evidence that Mother Earth is in fact able to self-organize her environment electrically. So that's where that's where I come in, if I may say humbly. Um, the title of my book is Origin of Biologic Neg Entropy. And by that I mean is the origin of what makes any biologic system self-organizing, self-regulating. And I give you a, a key example. If you look at the harmonics, and maybe we can put some graphics in later, it's all at fractalfield.com. But if you look at the harmonics of the Schumann resonance of the planet Earth, the, the 3, 8, 13, 21 hertz, the frequency cascade well documented to the Schumann harmonic series actually happens to fit an equation, my equation, entitled Origin of Biologic Negentropy, the origin of all self organizing ki- systems. For example, what could prevent climate and environment from going into chaos in general in pure physics. And the equation uh, called origin of negentropy is basically my original development. It's if you take the Planck length and time, which is the musical key signature of every wave that physics has ever measured, 
It is clearly the musical key s- signature of the universe, and no one disagrees. So we know at the musical key of every wave physics has ever measured in length, time, or energy, Planck length, time, and mass. And you multiply by powers, multiples of golden mean ratio, which is fractality perfected, you land on pre- almost precisely those Schumann resonance harmonics. In other words, that perfected fractality, it looks like a caduceus. In fact, the animation literally looks like the grail. You can see it, goldenmean.info slash grail, is what makes Earth electrically centripetal, implosive, fractal, that is self-similar. So self-similarity perfected is precisely the problem golden mean ratio solves. That's why it's called beauty in aesthetics, but it's more than beauty, it's the answer to a primary question in physics, which is what makes systems implosive, therefore centripetal, therefore self-organizing. And this is, it's a radical new hypothesis in the sense, and if you see the cover of our Facebook group and YouTube page, it's all at fractalfield.com. The hypothesis is that that fractality is the cause and mechanism of all centripetal and negentropic forces. Up until now, unfortunately, physics has not had a clue to what makes anything centripetal. For example, why objects fall to the ground. Physics, NASA, Stephen Hawking, Einstein, they do not have a clue why objects fall to the ground. But when you apply my equation, Planck times golden ratio, you get exactly the radii of hydrogen, proving exactly how hydrogen is fractal and therefore implosive. So now we know quite clearly exactly how and why hydrogen makes gravity, and is, by the way, phase conjugate, that means implosive, centripetal. So now, I mean, you didn't want the whole shtick about the physics here, I'm sure, and your people are not physics, but I'm an electrical engineer who went into physics in order to understand nature. So how we apply that to environment. You see, Once we understand, for example, if you make a magnetic map of a bioregion and you restore the magnetic lines, basically look like a rose, it becomes centripetal and the weather emerges from chaos, actually. So uh, wonderfully, Amar is actually with us today from uh, from Brazil. So, So glad you're here and thank you for introducing Amar. But Amar actually tested our science of rainmaking based on this principle. You can see the pictures and the film goldenmean.info slash rain. So the way we make rain is you take that magnetic map and you rearrange some lines. You install paramagnetic stone or piezoelectric crystal, look like a rose or a labyrinth or a stone circle. And you orient that around a magnetic line cross. And that makes the local magnetism centripetal, negentropic self-organizing. And, and Amara's friends now, they're beautifully told the story. You know, the, the fire is coming to the village and, uh, and they had the kids go out and make the labyrinth and they saved the village. There's multiple stories like that. And we have these stories all around the planet. So that's an example. Now you can see also this work to make the paramagnetism fractal and negentropic to make the environment emerge from chaos. And in, in terms of the geometry of labyrinth, a classic ancient paramagnetic technique to make centripetal force, many pictures, goldenmean.info slash labyrinth. So we had the RAIN project, the labyrinth project, also our geobiology um, uh, skills. It's basically what you need is basic dousing skills to find the magnetic lines and make sure they are not torn up because that's the bloodstream of Mother Earth Gaia. Specifically at... uh, peaceuniversity.net, which is our major international peace project, peaceuniversity.net. You will see the international correct curriculum for teaching peacemaking precisely on this physics, which is, if you're an electrical engineer like me, you have a clear definition of peacemaking. It's how electric fields make peace, become centripetal negative And we apply that directly, directly to the process, the, 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 protocol for eliminating war. I give you an example. When uh, famous Professor Phil Callahan was my protege in Florida, he's very famous, and he documented that where war breaks out, he, he, Vukovar, he did Israel, Ireland, Yugoslavia, where war breaks out, it is where the magnetic lines broke. Literally, 
So when they put that highway in and they put that big sewer pipe in and they cut a major earth magnetic line, earth's fractal magnetic bloodstream starts to bleed. And so if you cut the magnetic line between village A and village B, eventually the emotions don't pass and they make war. Whereas, for example, when he was sailing down the Amazon, he found out that he could predict in advance if the next village of, of uh, indigenous people were friendly or if they were headhunters. And the way he would predict that was measure whether the soil was conducting magnetism. So it's called paramagnetics. So this is an introduction to the beauty of geobiology. So actually the process of peacemaking, and there's examples actually in the literature, they went to Vukovar after the war and the underground water measurably disappeared because the magnetic lines were cut and the women restored fractality, built labyrinths, a wonderful story. Anyway, it's all at peaceuniversity.net. And that's one of the reasons that inspired me to actually meet your group and try to share this science of peacemaking. Thank you very much, Dan. That was extremely insightful. Um, and uh, to the audience, please do visit Dan's website, um, the details of which can be found in the description to the video. Um, Dr. Jasdeb Wright, could I please ask you to briefly introduce yourself to our audience um, and tell us a little bit about the environmental conservation work uh, that you and your colleagues have been doing uh, over the years? Right. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, Jasdeb Singh Rai, uh, Director of Sikh Human Rights Group, and we've uh, taken a position for a long time uh, that the approach to uh, our environment should be pluralistic, that um, many civilizations and cultures have long had um, uh, practices, theories, and concepts that uh, relate a human, human being to the environment and uh, human responsibility towards the environment, how much we can um, invade it or destroy it or um, use it. Uh, without uh, ultimate destruction. Uh, the one approach that uh, the International Climate Movement or United Nations takes uh, is not, it doesn't seem to be very effective. So it, they need, there needs, needs to be a, 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 uh, a multi, not multicultural, but uh, multiple approaches, learning from each other, learning from best practices. And what I've heard from you is very interesting. Uh, if I can pose a question, um, you've, um, you've said that uh, if there are disruptions to these magnetic fields, then, they can, then it can lead to war. Uh, does the, does, uh, in, your, in, your, um, uh, in your opinion, does it eventually compensate uh, or do, do we uh, end up destroying some uh, feel so much that uh, they are beyond repair and um, it, it, does it become hopeless? It's true that the, the health and fractality of the magnetic lines are literally permission to touch for the ecosystem and ability of the moisture and air movement patterns become fractal, centripetal, and negentropic. And basic dowsing skills tell us whether or not the magnetic lines an example, we believe a major reason why a big part of Australia is a desert is because the magnetic lines actually were damaged in the, uh, it was actually a, a war of the sexes and the Aboriginal people. There. There's a curse structure. And when you travel and you break those curses between the men tribe and the women tribe, storms will follow you across the continent. It's well known. And so the, the magnetic coherence of the land uh, well, let me, just one more very practical measured example. Uh, when the famous um, uh, Oregon Wilhelm Reich group, uh, James DeMeo, they, it's a paper called Desertification and Patriarchy. And they proved by measurement that the spread of, of patriarchy causes the spread of deserts. You can make a direct measured uh, link. And it's really quite simple. In a culture where permission to touch is forbidden, uh, that same permission to touch applies to magnetic lines. Whereas in all the ancient matriarchies, of Minoah, Crete, in the matriarchies, there was permission to touch. And, and so permission to touch the earth uh, enables that touch permissive fractality. So it's not that, you know, patriarchy obviously is in balance, but the point is that when there is fear of touch, you actually cause the formation of deserts. And uh, I'd like to 
But if I may, in terms of your beautiful commitment to diversity, if I, if I may uh, suggest a direct connection to the physics of self-organizing structure. I'll give you this example. If you are a medical doctor and you would like to know whether a person has an immune system, the easiest way to measure that is you measure what's called harmonic inclusiveness in their heart rate variability. In other words, if their heart rate is stuck in, stuck in one place and you measure that, you know that person is toast and they're about to die. It's medically proven and known. Whereas if the heart rate is, has lots of variability, literally the fractal heart is a healthy heart. That's a quote from a famous paper in the medical literature, uh, Ari Goldberg, a friend actually. And what that fractality and heart rate variability means is inclusiveness, not just in your heart, measures sustainability in your immune health. But we take that much further. We say harmonic inclusive fractality predicts the viability of every living system. So if ever there were physics to underline your idea about encouraging diversity, you see, and in fact, that's, you know, we have been teaching for many years. It's, it's called uh, uh, goldenmean.info slash ending religion wars. <laughs> and our, our perspective on ending religion wars, I think, agrees with yours in many ways, which is that actually, you know, for, for decades, people thought, well, physics would collapse the beauty and richness and sacredness of the idea of the divine in Christ. But actually, the opposite is the case. And we've been teaching this successfully for over 30 years, which is if you understand the deep and profound physics behind that circulation of charge called chi, orgon, barakta, shaktipat, the quality of grace, what makes that charge feel self-organized literally embed the collective unconsciousness, uh, literally what we used to call heaven is that fractal charge distribution. In fact, there's an elaborate engineering to this. It's called lo coherent longitudinal interferometry, which is the coherence of the longitudinal electric field on, around your body, which enables you to lucid dream and therefore take memory through death, literally the ba from the ka, the, the kesjan body, the rainbow light body, the etheric body, there's many terms. But in electrical engineering, now we understand electrically what we used to call the divine, you can underscore with the beauty of physics. And in our view, that inclusiveness then, then, then proves the physics that eliminates the need for religion wars, because we can all agree on the pure principles, which are divine, which is a name for fractality. Anyway, I carry on, but I'm enthused. <laughs> Um, and, you know, there are um, a few areas in the world which seem to be in a perpetual state of war or they, uh, there's a war for a, uh, a decade or so and then it ends and then starts again. One is the Middle East and then uh, this whole uh, Afghanistan area, it's all, 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 almost always has been at war really. Uh, and then uh, uh, the area around the focuses around the, the Yugoslavia, previous Yugoslavia, now we have Ukraine and Russia at it, that area. Is, um, do you have a theory on that? <laughs> you know, I have a theory on most everything. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> no, but I, I would like to, I think your question is excellent, and I would like to take the example of Jerusalem. Yeah. Now, you know that, of course, you're, you know, if ever there's a famous place that's been at war forever, it would be Jerusalem. Now, I have been studying what I believe is the extraterrestrial history of Earth for 30 to 50 years, and I teach extensively. Uh, it's all at fractalfield.com slash fusion in the blood, the ET history of Earth, which includes the Anunnaki, the Draco, and the whole story about, you know, the genetic engineering, Adam and Eve, and, but with many corroborating details and many corroborating witnesses, including uh, I've worked with indigenous leaders around the world on this. Summary regarding Jerusalem. Jerusalem, if you look at the ancient, well, Draco and Anunnaki meaning of that term, Uru Asa L M. Uru, we know, means ancient Draco or dragon blood, as in Uru, Uru An, or Roman Uru, all those words, Uru, have a core meaning ancient dragon blood. And they had powerful DNA, they just were very warlike. But anyway, Uru Asa, Asa is the queen or royal of 
the Draco. And El has a very specific meaning, as in Elohim. It means the place of translation of vorticity. And we now know exactly what that means in physics. It means the place where the more disorderly transverse electromagnetic, because of compression, implosion fractality, at the centripetal point is converted into longitudinal or compression waves, sometimes incorrectly called scalar or torsional. And those who can make that L, we now can prove by measurement, are those who can lucid dream and astral project, take memory through death, because they propagate coherent longitudinal. And so what is it? What is a Jerusalem? A Jerusalem is literally a stargate. And by, by stargate, I mean specifically a place where the body's aura is enabled to plasma project. Now, if you study the ET history for 50 years, like I have, you know, the war is always over the stargate. Because basically, you don't want to be stuck on kindergarten. <laughs> but th the fun thing is, once you know the physics that for example, Cairo, Egypt, Giza, the pyramids, that is a squirt gun for plasma projection. I was there in the king's chamber, and I know what happens. You can project your awareness in the plasma into the stars at which it points very accurately, Sirius and Orion. So the reason there's a war over the stargate is because people don't understand the immortality potential of their own aura. So it's like uh, the story I tell about Jerusalem. It's like... Uh, the bees are having a war over honey because they just forgot how to make honey. <laughs> well, in fact, the stargate is broken, for one thing. And for another, once you understand geobiology and how to project your aura, then you have a definite, clear electrical path through death, that implosive coherence longitude projection. We can prove it because we can trigger lucid dreaming replicably Therify.net, our inter international plasma rejuvenation technology. Think of it as a med bed. And so this implosive plasma field triggers lucid dreaming for the same reason that Jerusalem was a stargate. It's the places where the magnetic lines cross in a fractal, the definition of, fract of, of sacred space. Uh, I know I've gone a little too long on this, but just to finish the thought, when Professor Konstantin Karatkov, our very good friend, went to the place where the Kogi make their phone calls to ancestors. And he measured the fractality of the air, which is simply the place where charge distribution is enabled. The only definition of heaven, plains of Sharon, Champs-Élysées. And he proved that you could measure sacred space electrically, the place where phone calls to ancestors are possible, the place where Kozy Rev proved military quality telepathy is possible. We show three ways to measure that at goldenmean.info slash architecture. Point being that once you understand how to create sacred space, then you don't need a war over Jerusalem. <laughs> anyway, there's my example. Thank you very much, Dan. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Rai. Um, we're now gonna uh, delve into a variety of prominent environmental questions. I I'm then gonna give the floor to my colleague, Ms. Bethan Walters, who will ask you a few questions uh, that are more specifically related to your current research, Dan. Um, so, uh, to begin, um, Dan, when we last spoke, you mentioned that you've been teaching the physics of consciousness for many decades. Therefore, I was wondering if it would be at all possible for you to provide our audience uh, with a very basic or rudimental insight into precisely what this term means, um, and maybe to give us some examples alongside. <laughs> well, thank you for asking the fun questions, and you're right, that is my passion. Actually, I'm here with a wonderful filmmaker, Ari from Netherlands, making a documentary film on the history of physics of consciousness right now. <laughs> so stay tuned for the movie. <laughs> but, but briefly, um, my graduate work, psychophysiology, was literally the electric physics of emotion. We were the first to measure the difference between fear and anger. So the electrical nature of emotion is my work in physics. And we have four or five major apps on the App Store for biofeedback to measure coherent emotion. And I am credited in the literature, which with discovering the term heart coherence for discovering how to measure heart coherence, realheartcoherence.com. And basically when your heart becomes internally phase coherence, and I involve the math to measure that it's a second order power spectra called sepstrom, which measures internal phase coherence. And when you say, I love you, if you are telling the truth at that moment, your heart coherence goes way up. Whereas if you tell a lie every single time, it goes way down. 
And it is a, a commercially useful lie detector. It's also useful for teaching Tantra. So real heart twins. So where does that lead us to the physics of consciousness? Well, our other app there, flameandmind.com, pursues other work that I did. You know, Professor Karatkov, the same professor, first measured the kids in St. Petersburg able to see without their eyes. They went to a trance bliss state and they had their eyes closed and they could see without their eyes. He determined that the best way to measure that was look for golden mean ratio between the alpha and beta frequency in brain waves. In other words, your brain wave frequencies make an implosive caduceus, hint my original equation. So we've taken that at flameandmind.com with our partners, Iris there in Netherlands, where they have a large group of kids. And there are these groups all over the world where kids go into a relaxed trance bliss state, they're blindfolded, and then they can see without their eyes. They play Rubik's Cubes and draw coloring books. The films are all there, flameandmind.com. So if you ask those kids, how are you seeing without your eyes? Here's the physics of consciousness right now. They say, oh, well, I see a wormhole, a tube, a vortex or tornado open inside my head only after I go into a relaxed bliss trance. And they look down that tube inside their head and it becomes an eyeball. Every, you know, don't just ask one kid. You can ask a hundred kids the same question, the ones who are seeing without their eyes. Well, guess what that vortex tube that becomes an eyeball is inside your head? It's a plasma vortex tornado. It's a plasma vortex of charge. So now suddenly we have explained for the first time in history after my good friend Bill Tiller measured like 20 different ways that focused human attention causes electric fields to compress. The book is called Conscious Acts of Creation. For the first time now we know why focused attention is centripetal. Then Yuri Geller measured that focused human attention reduces radioactivity. Now, you know, when the other famous physics of consciousness people, uh, uh, it's Gary Schwartz and uh, Stuart Hameroff, you know, they say, well, the microtubule enables charge collapse, and that's consciousness. Well, that's a good introduction, but that's only the beginning. Perfected charge collapse is the implosion, and macrocellularly, that's what the big vortex inside your head is when your brainwave harmonics make that golden ratio caduceus named flameandmind.com. You're squeezing that plasma vortex. It comes to a point tuned to plunk by equation. We need to know the frequency signature, and suddenly that tornado sorts waves into phase, which is the phase conjugate definition of perception, fractalfield.com slash conjugate perception. So actually, uh, now for the first time, when these dozens of medical surgeons document that they went outside their body during their near-death experience and looked at their body from outside their body and saw the surgeon drilling a hole in their head for their near-death experience. They even know where they were outside their body when they were looking at themselves from outside their body. Guess what? This physics of consciousness tells you exactly what traveled outside your body. That plasma donut vortex tornado cannot survive inside an aluminum box. No, <laughs> you need sacred space. So once you get a clue to the real physics of consciousness, which is the building of this centripetal tornado, once you know what consciousness is, for example, now we know exactly why if you remove the poisonous fluorescent lights from your kid's classroom and restore photosynthesis sunlight harmonics, you have a dramatic increase in attention span. Measurable. It's called health and light by John Ott. The physics is that those frequencies support compression, implosion, which is the definition of consciousness. So that's why when you're in a sacred stone circle, your vision is sharp. That's why when you emerge from therify.net plasma, 30% of people report a sharpening of vision. We know exactly what causes vision. So, you know, we, we're passionate because once you can teach what causes focused perception, you can also teach what causes bliss and trance and all the beautiful things that religion le leads you, the divine spiritual experience. So, yes, I'm passionate about the physics of consciousness. Thank you for asking the question. No, thank you very much, Dan. That was um, extremely interesting, I'm sure, for all of our readers, um, sorry, all of our listeners. Um, Dan, in, my next question is more related to climate change generally. Um, and that is, in your uh, expert opinion, what are the greatest challenges or issues that our global community faces when it comes to combating or addressing uh, the negative impacts of climate change? 
Well, uh, I think the idea that the temperature is increasing due to carbon dioxide is obviously simplistic. Actually, my friends, the scientists say the actual danger is more imminent in the acidification of the oceans because that not only is that our, most of our food supply, but it's also our oxygen supply. And it's true that the carbon dioxide by acidifying the oceans means, you know, we as a species may be dead within you know, decades very soon. So for example, that would be a major issue. Another major issue is that uh, solar flares regularly toast this neighborhood, let's be real. <laughs> and I, I'd like to point out a couple of things. One is that um, solar, maxima, sometimes called the Carrington event, uh, have are similar to the physics of this tornado we just discussed. Uh, we know, we actually you can find it on our website, the, the Solar Heart Community, um, that on 11 different occasions, it was measured that when a million children sang the same song together, the solar flares dramatically reduced. Uh, and uh, the, the physics, I think that's at, at peaceuniversity.net also you can see the, the graph. Um, the physics are instructive. Uh, you know, planets, uh, stars like our sun do not cook up DNA without a purpose. Uh, collectively, we have the ability to make the centripetal force that ultimately makes star inhabiting possible. The plasma intelligence at the heart of the sun is a fabulous fabulous thing. Actually, almost every ancient religion, especially including Christianity, is literally a sun god religion for a very specific reason, Atun, as it were. The sun's plasma is so very, very intelligent, and its centripetal forces are directly related, for example, to fertility, uh, gestation, etc. Actually, when uh, <clears throat> the famous book Tutankhamun Prophecies predicted that the reason the ancient uh, Maya left was because fertility dropped because the solar flare patterns were inhibiting ovulation. So point is we need to understand our relationship to the solar flare patterns and begin to use that relationship. Actually, my view here would be that our best hope is to make an alliance with the extraterrestrials who are trying to help us. Uh, we believe the Galactic Federation has arrived very actively. We believe Elena Denon, who is teaching actively with our friend Michael Sala, exopolitics.org, and have removed many of the parasitic grays and ETs here, and are able to help us with our relationship with the solar flares and the maintenance of atmosphere. You know, it's not a coincidence that when Zachariah Sitchin wrote, first wrote his book about the Anunnaki, he said the reason they made the gold mining slaves called human, Takadama, and they were genetic engineers, the Anunnaki, was to, because they were using the gold to repair the home atmosphere. Well, how does gold repair home atmosphere? Well, hello, the electric geometry of gold in a nanostate is called the Plains of Sharon, which happens to be the Hebrew name for heaven. Well, actually, if you make a, a, a nano phase conjugate field of the gold atom, the electron shell unpacking geometry goes potentially infinite. That's literally what's called Plains of Sharon in um, in Lawrence Gardner's Genesis of the Grail King. But the Plains of Sharon is a name for a propagating fractal electric field that becomes inhabitable. So our best chance actually is large scale geobiology. You know, the ancients put every single global pyramid site on a dodeca ecosa earth grid for one very specific reason. Not only did they succeed with what Tesla failed at, which is a global power distribution without wires, because that is a longitudinal interferometric, interferometric array. That's what that is. And that's how you do a global array without wires. But it's also, it's also how you repair the home atmosphere, because it makes the entire body centripetal and negentropic. So we need a global effort. And we have it, the most advanced geobiologists in, our, in the world are on our team on this. So we have very specific ideas to work on this. So Basically, the, my answer to your question is my bumper sticker, which says, get fractal or get dead. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Chester, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to add. Yeah, to um, it's very interesting, really. It's um, going into a very uh, different uh, field from the one we are normally used to and the physics that we have normally read. 
and all that. In the Sikh philosophy, there is the concept of Nad and Anahad. Nad means any, anything that takes form, whether it's waves or particles or uh, plants or humans or everything that takes form. And Anahad is, the, uh, is that which does not take form. Now, uh, you, uh, 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 and from there, the, the, the idea is that the consciousness, conscious, uh, mm -hmm. does not really have form and takes form through particles. Okay, there is, a, in the first uh, part of the uh, Guru Granth Sahib, is about uh, the five things that come together to form a particle. Okay. Uh, now, are you... Um, uh, uh, one of the things about science is it's always trying to bring it uh, down to some sort of a particle. A particle in wavelengths are, in a way, they they are dependent on on some sort of a particle, very you know uh, nanoparticles or nano nanoparticles, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, okay. Does does plasma have a, have form? Uh, does the conscious have form uh, as as wavelength? That, that's a beautiful and very appropriate question. First of all, we are clear, and any physicist worth his salt is clear, the concept of a particle was a mistake. It's simple. <laughs> the, the universe consists of a single contiguous compressible media, sometimes called ether, but is in fact the compression and rarefaction of charge, which behaves as a superfluid. And, and the difference between what you call nagua, I call tonal and nagual, from the indigenous Americans, which is where I come from, which means exactly the same thing in my view, the place where charge compression has created critical centripetal force and therefore stored inertia, the only definition for mass. So for example, a more accurate way to do that language would be to say that you now have a compressible media that behaves as a fluid, which is plus or minus charge, which is simply compression and rarefaction in a superfluid media charge, the ether. And when that charge rotates, you measure the inertia stored, and that is the only definition and origin of mass, the particle. And you measure the period of that rotation, and that's the only definition and origin of time. So charge rotation is the origin of both mass and time. And what keeps charge rotating in one place namely the cause of gravity, is phase conjugate fractality. Read our published physics paper on the fractal conjugate cause of gravity, fractalfields.com slash conjugate gravity. What made that particle stay in one place? And my new equation for the radii of hydrogen, Planck times integer exponents of Golan ratio, newly predicted the radii of hydrogen for the first time predicting how hydrogen is fractal and proving how hydrogen makes gravity. And the other smoking gun is when Professor Raymond Chow measured the velocities faster than light. Guess what the measured velocities faster than light are? Golden ratio times C. So what went out the center of that implosive tornado? So not only do we understand the potential of charge to compress and thus be named mass, the difference between not nagual and tonal, we actually have an equation which then predicts how to make gravity. Um, following from that, uh, the uh, one day, I think the differences between uh, some of the uh, civilizations or philosophies and uh, what we might call uh, the modern uh, uh, scientific age, not, not the one that you are propagating, is that uh, in those philosophies, uh, we are persuaded to accept uh, rather than disrupt and rather than be too um, inquisitive, rather than think that I, man, can create, uh, that I have to accept what we call in six is a pana, which is what uh, uh, the rules of nature or whatever there is, and you have to, I have to accept my limitations. And if I accept that, then I have a better life and contentment. But when I am trying to say, no, I, I, can, uh, I can create, I can destroy, and I can do this, which is what uh, we seem to be doing with a lot of science, um, uh, disrupting uh, what are, as you're saying, uh, natural forces, uh, natural, uh, you know, places of... Uh, uh, these um, 
uh, I think uh, plasma vortexes, etc. Uh, then we create disruption. So, would your message to the modern world be that we have to try and understand our limits? Again, a super appropriate question. I mean, first of all, what we are saying is that plasma itself becomes intelligent under implosive or recursive the origin of self-awareness, literally. When, when donuts uh, become implosive, ball lightning responds repeatedly to telepathy, it's well known. So intelligence in plasma is the issue here. And so then your question, which is, you know, do we actually have a power to create? <laughs> and my view would be that creation physics is literally embeddability physics. In other words, your ability to embed or get centripetal ultimately depends on what I would call the physics of pure intention. Remember when I said, if you measure heart coherence, it's literally a measure of whether you should buy a used car from the salesman <laughs> because if his eyes are shifty, it means he's unable to focus waves and therefore does not, is not a shareable wave. So what we mean by a shareable wave, and our friends have thesharablewave.com, is a precisely a wave that's distributable. But now when we understand that that is how ancestral memory propagates, you know, Aboriginal song line, dreaming track, heaven, all these names, com communion of saints, the actual Ancestral memory is that fractal array, which has been in the business of gathering survival memory for a million years. And to get compressed into that array is exactly the physics of dying well. Uh, and uh, so once you understand what serves survival collectively and then embed in that, which means every single thought must be pure principle only. And when it is, that thought will attract the capacitive charge you call bliss or a blessing. Your hair will stand up. That is the physics of Eureka experience. So the reason you attract charge when you think a shareable thought that serves collective survival is because you have discovered embeddability and pure principle and survival will be served by your intent. So that means when you're driving past a mountain, if you think a shareable thought, you will attract a lot of charge and you'll be then you, you can take that charge and create with it. Literally, ultimately then, pure intention determines the size of your aura and what, what you take with you at death and the physics of whether you are a creator. In the um, whole climate field, there, are, there seem to be two different approaches one is that we messed it up and we need to restore um, the ecosystems. We've messed up the sea, we've messed up the oceans, we need to restore that and then understand that, uh, you know, there are limits to what we can do. The other one are these uh, brave new scientists who are saying we can put little mirrors up in the space and then reflect light and, uh, you know, all sorts of gadgetry things that we can uh, save ourselves from. What's your opinion on that? Uh, I think the artificial ideas for mirrors and other mechanical ways to restore environment have great limitations. And what I would choose to emphasize instead would be the intelligence of plasma. I give you an example. Uh, when our young people understand that seeing and playing with nature spirits uh, ultimately enables not just fertility, but the larger nature spirits steer tornadoes every day. They're called gnomes, undies, the sylph. So large scale plasma intelligences are our necessary ally to restore our environment, absolutely. And until we can teach our kids to actually communicate with the elemental forces, you know, clairvoyance, and most of the elementals die in big cities, unfortunately, we've seen, we've measured that. Uh, you can see pictures of elementals at goldenmean.info slash geobiology. But those are our allies for the restoration you speak. And once we recognize that plasma is intelligence, you know what our ge geobiology friends say? They say the elemental forces, the gnomes and the undines, regard the humans as drunk because we don't talk to them. And they believe that the fact that our tornadoes are unsteered is precisely because we haven't learned to communicate. And we have many 
many geobiology shaman partners who have steered tornadoes. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Dan, and thank you very much, Dr. Rye. Um, I only have one final question for you, Dan, um, and that is, uh, before I pass over to my colleague Bethan, um, is there one small thing, in your opinion, that we could all adopt into our daily routines that would significantly help us to mitigate and adapt to the negative impacts of climate change? Well, it may, it may sound a bit cliche, but our view is that until you have a regular source of bliss experience, you are in fact, by definition, a parasite. That is, you do not have your own source of charge. In addition, access to bliss determines if you get an immune system and if you take memory through death. And access to bliss defines politics because body polis means the coherent plasma body, for example, what a beehive requires in order to swarm. So in physics, the function of politics is clearly to enable people to have bliss experience, which is simply to become charged radiant. And when that centripetal moment of bliss experience is enabled, it actually defines the origin of culture. You know, we brag about our shoe polish and the color of our wine, but the fact is the aboriginals knew the definition of culture. Do you know how to teach your child how to have a bliss experience? If you do, then you have culture because that child is going to get an aura and eventually steer not just tornadoes, but actually uh, take memory through death. For example, get a soul. So once you have access to a form of bliss experience, you know, yoga, tai chi, sacred gymnastics, there's a hundred ways, but we teach the physics of bliss, flameandmind.com, which is a correlate by measurement. Access to bliss experience enables you to become part of the living plasma of your environment. Once you have bliss experience, you will feel magnetic lines much better. You will become a better dowser because the magnetic lines come to you. You become a superconductor for them. And that means you begin to hear the voices of your ancestors. You begin to hear the voices of trees in the forest and the mountains. So I recommend some form of bliss practice. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the floor to my colleague, uh, as I said, Miss Bethan Walters, who will ask you a few questions um, that are directly related to your current work. Hi, Daniel. Thank you very much. Um, so my first question is, um, you, make, you make a very compelling argument for why the United Nations should ensure that uh, your findings are represented. This, of course, aligns with our push for there to be a more pluralistic approach in uh, international organisations and agencies such as the UN. Therefore, my first question to you is, do you believe that this is something that we will see in the next 10 to 20 years? Or do you believe that it is currently too foreign for much of the Northern Hemisphere um, who make the decisions in the UN? Well, I think the, the human species is going to need to recognize very soon uh, what physics has known ever since negentropy, self-organization was first measured. You know, self-organization was measured in physics the first time they made lasers phase conjugate, it's called phase conjugate optics and a phase conjugate mirror. And they made time reversal and negentropy, self-organization. In fact, the principle behind that self-organization is in general, the physics of the only way out of chaos literally. <laughs> so it's really fairly obvious here that if you would like a way out of chaos, it's important to understand what negative entropy and how that can be applied in every living system. We know the frequency signatures for your heart beat. We know the frequency signature for your brain wave. We know the frequency signature for your breathing, heart rate variability, yoga. We know the frequency signature for the magnetic lines of the environment. We know the frequency signature for hydrogen, we, we know the frequency signature to enable propulsion, both warp and impulse power. And all of those are the same equation. So this pure principle of fractal negentropy, self-organization, restored centripetal forces can be applied in every field that needs to emerge from chaos directly and by equation. And I think it is essential that the United Nations recognize that. Basically, you know, the lesson here is fairly simple. Uh, start with a magnetic map of your bed and your house and your village and rearrange them to look like a rose and then you're done. <laughs> you know, every ancient African village, the magnetic map was a, looked like a rose. 
It literally is called Fractality in African Architecture. It's a famous paper. So the shaman knew, and we need to teach that at the UN. Thank you, Daniel, that was great. Um, so the next question is, do you believe that there are enough experts globally in your field to bring your field to the United Nations? Or do you feel that more funded research is needed before people become engaged in or further convinced um, of this stand on um, of science, rather? Our therify.net plasma, therify.net, T-H-E-R-A-P-H-I, therify.net plasma, is functionally doing rejuvenation and neg entropy commercially, successfully, rapidly growing in 25 countries. Uh, so we know uh, by documented commercial success, the path to regeneration, rejuvenation, neg entropy. And that plasma is just one example. And obviously there's research going on in every field. The good news is that we have partners we have partners in propulsion. We have partners in energy. We have partners in many of these fields, many of whom are the, are the best on the planet. And so obviously the research is continuing, but the core physics needs to be implemented very quickly. And for example, energy science. Uh, the lecture I did in Amsterdam at the Breakthrough Energy Movement Conference, you can see it, uh, fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. And what we showed was that every single zero point vacuum energy, quote unquote, free energy system in history is based on the same core physics, charge implosion. You get more fractal than your environment and you attract charge. So the same reason zero point energy, for example, the Kosky frost crystal that made 800 times its own weight in gravity, that fractal field.com slash propulsion. Uh, every single zero point energy technology is the same physics as how humans make bliss. You get more fractal in your environment electrically. You implode and attract charge. Commercially, for example, theimploder.com. We're in about 20 countries doing implosion in water, as Victor Schauberger well did. In fact, the vortex is called Schauberger's dream. So we have many commercially successful examples, flameandmind.com, theimploder.com, therify.net, to show that the science is mature enough now that we can begin to apply these principles. We can make med magnetic maps of the ocean and the land and begin to restore centripetal and megantropic forces, and we must do it urgently. You know, it, it maybe just one postscript thought on that. The ancestor for the reason Thule is the name for the South Pole and the North Pole and the and Atlantis and the Egypt, Egyptian royal line is called Thuthmosis. They were all named Thule Tehuti after Thoth, Hermes, who's really a you know, partner of Enki, it's a long story. But what he called the caduceus, literally the principle of physics of life force and the symbol of all of medicine, today is the physics of phase conjugation precisely. So it's obvious that we now know what made the life force of Hermes. The idea is hermetically sealed. <laughs> And if you take the equation for phase conjugation, it's a caduceus, which ha happens to be the logo of therify.net. So there's abundant re reasons to believe we can restore life force once we understand the principle of life, what life force is. It also means we must not be sending our children to schools made with steel and aluminum and electrosmog because that is going to destroy their souls. We must send them to buildings made of biologic material, which have a high dielectric constant where the magnetic lines are alive. And by the way, that is the only possible place for birth and death to happen successfully as well. And um, how do you see your, um, your ideas in relation to what is happening at CERN? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we taught m many times in Geneva next to CERN, and some of the science physicists actually came to my lectures. It was amazing. <laughs> and one, one of the CERN physicists looked at me and said, you don't want to go there. It's a Nephilim institution. <laughs> well, in fact, the concept that you need to smash an atom in order to find out what subatomic particles is and what holds them together is absurd. It isn't that it's going to kill us. It's just that it's stupid and a waste of resource. In fact, we know what glues an atom together. 
The subatomic particle geometry is fractal. It's literally a platonic nest. The geometry of the nuclear hadrons is precisely tetracube octaecosa, uh, goldenmean.info slash creation. And then the geometry of the electron shell nest, SPDF, is toroid tetracube dodecaecosa, simply a platonic nest. When we teach chemistry, properly to our kids, showing them how to visualize how waves form electron shells and nuclear geometry, which is simply alchemic, fractal, platonic, non-destructive charge collapse, then uh, we won't need CERN because we will understand the principle of what bends a wave in the first place. As the Sufis would say, only love bends the light, it, therefore only love creates. W what they meant was, <laughs> if, if if you feel for that wave, you will create a centripetal force enabling you to bend the light. If you feel the love, which is simply inventability, low five. And that ability to bend the wave to become centripetal is the physics of why only love bends the light and therefore only love creates. Can I ask another question following that? Um... You think your work will uh, influence uh, medicine in the future, medical care in the future, because medicine approaches the human body as a mechanical um, instrument, and uh, you know we we uh, we sort of do experiment and say this is what uh, um, is causing the disease, and then attack that, and uh, or treat that, or put more uh, drugs in uh, a person's uh, body to uh, to ensure that. Um, uh, it can um, it can tackle that, uh, but you are bringing another dimension. Do you think that that will uh, find itself into medical care? Because it is in many some other some other civil cultures, they they they, they have a different approach to healthcare. Yeah, um, beautiful, yes. Well, I, I mean, the core issue here is once you realize that it's the plasma intelligence that you take with you when you dream and when you die. And it's the plasma intelligence that determines your immune system electrically. And so what you need to feed in your aura, and the aura is measurable, you know, you can make a decision on which broccoli to eat and what medicine and what vaccine to take by aura measurement. And you will know if you have served immortality or death. So once we recognize that your aura and your plasma field, your, your ba from the cause it were, is your roadmap to bliss and immortality and immune health, then suddenly it, medicine looks completely different. So things like Therify.net, which are plasma that directly, directly feeds the aura, which most people would say was the opposite of the medical approach. But, but that is the purest example of energy medicine there ever was. <laughs> so yeah, medicine probably needs to, it's, it's not that the molecular mechanisms are wrong, they're not. It's important to, just, to, to understand and, and that research is powerful and useful, but ultimately, what holds the molecular array together is the fractal field of the intelligent plasma, literally your aura, what you would call your soul. So once we understand the physics of soul, for example, which is measurable, we know where the plasma from the body goes after death. We know how many hours it takes to leave the body at death. And we know why it goes where it goes. It goes to the place of power fractal because that sacred space in the room is what enables the aura to be compressed to enter what you call ancestor memory. So it's quite true that physics now can teach very accurately the physics of what is soul, uh, goldenmean.info slash immortality, you see the pictures. And so once we're able to teach the physics of what's a soul, guess what? Then we'll stop looking for the ghost in the machine. We'll stop talking about transhumanism and realize there will never ever be a soul or a spirit in a computer it ain't going to happen and we need to understand that difference sooner rather than later or we're going to be joining those boards like those umites who are ruled by an artificial intelligence and that's an interstellar problem thank you daniel that was really uh, interesting so this leads quite nicely to my last question do you believe that your research and findings should be taught in educational establishments globally, or is this um, school of thought um, that should stay at a more advanced level? Um, if so, do you, how do you envision your research and findings being taught at a level, and how do you anticipate it being received by various populations around the globe? 
You know, we originally wrote this curriculum for kids. The book is called Implosion, Secret Science of Ecstasy and, and Immortality. It's a hygiene for bliss to teach this to kids. The book is free in PDF. It's used around the world. Goldenmean.info slash conscious kids. No, this is a kid's curriculum. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, in, in the Steiner School, uh, they teach the kids to close their eyes and visualize a rose after drawing it. And if they do it accurately enough, the test of success is if the room fills with the smell of roses. We teach the physics of how that works. It's the flowering brain infrared physics of olfaction, actually. That's the reason the room fills with the smell of roses after the children have accurately visualized a rose. Now, those children lose the ability, that inner muscle, to make that image, IMOG image, if they watch too much TV and computer. You know why they lose the inner muscle to create literally if they watch too much TV and computer? Because the external generation of that image, IMOG, disabled the inner muscle to make pictures inside their head, which is the only real creation mechanics. It doesn't mean the kids can't use computers, but it means specific, especially when they're very young, under 10 years old, you must not let them be stuck in front of that screen because the inner muscle to form a picture inside their head is disabled. The Steiner schools taught that correctly. So no, I, I, I think this is not just a curriculum for experts. We have the physics. The physics equations are published. Publications, fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. But this is also a critical curriculum curriculum for young people, because if we can't teach young people to create that bliss process in themselves, you know, <laughs> that's the issue of ensoulment and the, the difference between a Borg AI culture and an ensouled human culture. Thank you, Daniel. That was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Carlos now, but thank you very much for answering those questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bethan. Um, Daniel, I just wanted to say um, thank you very much for appearing on this podcast. Um, we've all found it extremely interesting and insightful. Um, I just have a few concluding remarks, and that is um, this podcast has been brought to you by the Seek Human Rights Group. For more information about Mr. Daniel Winter and the Seek Human Rights Group's environmental and diversity policies, please visit our respective websites, the details to which can be found within the description to this video. Or alternatively, please visit our social media accounts at SHRG underscore NGO. I've been Carl Sabathnot. Thank you very much for listening.